I feel like at this point, it's becoming my brand to just change my filming setup. This will be the last time, um, no promises. Oh man, I just knocked him on my camera. I'm picking it up. Sorry about that. So I just want to apologize real quick in advance for the editing, the distortion and effect on the b-roll in this video. It has been blocked numerous times. I'm not playing around. I'm not doing this again. So hopefully this is fine. I'm sorry if it's overstimulating. I can't take myself seriously. Hi my lovelies! So as some of you may have noticed, I love The Haunting Hour. Maybe just a little too much. I mean, what other YouTuber has three separate videos on the subject? No, but I can't even like explain, I can't stress it enough. Lily D is actually like my Roman Empire. Like I think about her at least once a month. No, 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 no. at least once a week. For someone who's so obsessed with the show, and honestly R.L. Stein's work in general, as I was, you know, growing up, I was surprised to learn about the origin of the show stemming from a movie aka R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour, don't think about it. And for the sake of not wanting to get things confused, I'm gonna just be referring to this movie in the video um, as Don't Think About It. But honestly, if you really do want me to get into it, that's what the movie should be called because it's more relevant to the storyline and or lore of the evil thing. Okay, okay, we're getting too ahead of ourselves, I know. Anyway, Don't Think About It is a 2007 children's horror film made by R.L. Stein that stars Emily Osmont as our main character along with Cody Lindley, Brittany Elizabeth Garan, and Tobin Bell, the one and only Jigsaw himself. What a random ass cameo, but also not because R.L. Stein is literally the king of children's horror. So uh, he's truly a real one for being here. What's so interesting about this film though, is it was also partly inspired by a book of R.L. Stein's titled The Haunting Hour Chills in the Dead of Night. And the concept of this book was, it was a collection of scary short stories. So not like a full fledged story, like your usual Goosebumps book. And I say partly, like not because that's a fact, but that's just how I personally see it because none of the stories are related to the plot of this movie whatsoever. In fact, the only story to serve some sort of relevance to the Haunting Hour adaptations in general was My Imaginary Friend, which was recreated in the Haunting Hour TV series. Although Brush With Madness is actually very similar to a uh, story that was featured in the book titled Can You Draw Me? Now, is this relevant to the grand scheme of things, no. But is it a fun fact though? Yeah! Yes! I actually didn't know about this at all like throughout the process of my last three videos so I thought it was interesting to share. And speaking of other videos I've made on this subject, I actually mentioned this movie in last year's Halloween special where I ranked episodes of the TV show saying, you know, maybe this is what I need next year's Halloween special to be. And so as you can see, here we are. I indeed did watch R.L. Stein's Don't Think About It for the first time in honor of Halloween, my favorite holiday, and I I have lots and lots of thoughts and opinions about it. But before we dive too deep into this though, do you guys smell that? When it comes to perfumes, let's just say I'm clueless. Growing up, they were something I feel like I really strayed away from because my mom actually struggles with horrific migraines and scents that were too fragrant, you know, strong, would trigger them. And although I have been very fortunate to not have to deal with migraines, I've definitely had headaches that were triggered from strong scents too. So as a result, I was just like, uh, no. And that's why when Scentbird reached out to me, I was really excited, honestly. Because for the past couple years, especially as I've gotten older, I've wanted to kind of like venture into perfumes, give it a try, or generally find like a signature scent that I would enjoy. But obviously I've been intimidated and not known where to really start. Scentbird is basically a subscription service that sends you one or more perfume samples a month to try for roughly $17. That way, if you're fragrance sensitive like me, you can try these scents without committing yourself to the full bottle and potentially wasting your money. And as you can imagine, for a newbie like me, Scentbird makes the process of, I don't know, finding your scent for the first time super easy because just by taking a simple quiz, they're actually able to help curate a selection of scents that they think would allow 
align with your personal taste. As for the scents in question, Scentbird really offers a unique range of different perfumes, colognes, and even has unisex options. From designer brands like Gucci or Prada to popular artists like Ariana Grande, which I swear I've been hearing about her perfumes for what feels like forever, so that's why I got myself one to try. As you can see, each sample comes in a little container that also has this like little casing on it, and it locks and unlocks just by twisting it here, which is honestly so convenient for if you have a scent you want to take with you on the go, but worry about it potentially spilling in your bag. I know something similar has happened to me with taking my hairspray on the go, which is literally my signature scent at the moment because I don't use perfume. I swear, it smells so good. Funny enough, my scent bird actually fits perfectly in my new LPS inspired Ida bag, and if that isn't a sign from the universe, I don't know what is. Anyway, first we have Cloud by Ariana Grande, which my little card here tells me all of the scents, which include hair, coconut, vanilla, and more. I think I'm just gonna spray some on my wrist. Let's give it a try. I was honestly expecting it to be a lot stronger and like immediately be disappointed by it, but no, it's like very subtle and it smells very sweet and like airy. I could totally see myself, you know, committing to this. Another scent I thought would be really fun to try was Juicy Couture's Viva La Juicy, which includes smells like caramel and mandarin orange. One thing about me is like, even though I haven't like been using perfumes, I know what my signature scents are. I know what scents I enjoy. Off the top of my head, I have to say lavender, but an example that's relevant to this perfume is I've always been a huge citrus girly, as well as caramel, like, I love caramel, so obviously you know I gravitated to this one. Plus, throughout being on the internet and being in like nostalgia circles, a lot of people are really into Juicy Couture. Personally, I know nothing about it, but it seemed promising. So let's go ahead, oh my god, why can I never open these? Let's go ahead and give it a try. I guess I'll spray it on my other wrist because I don't want to like... I can't explain it, but I feel like this one smells more like a cologne, but it's not a cologne. And I'm not saying that to insult it. It definitely has like that citrusy kind of uh, smell, but it doesn't really like smell as citrusy as I expected. I don't know if that makes sense. It's definitely an interesting smell. I feel like I'm gonna need to try this one again, but it's definitely not bad and it's definitely not overpowering, which was my main concern when getting into perfumes. Now, you know what it is? I think the pear is very overpowering because it has that smell of like fruit, but it doesn't quite like, it wasn't berries and it wasn't the citrus. It was like the pear that was immediately like up my nostrils. Anyway, if you want to try Scentbird for yourself, you can use my link in the description and code LULALOOPSY for 55% off your first month with Scentbird. Or you can scan my QR code, which will be on screen. Ah, I have a QR code. I feel so fancy. Thank you so much again to Scentbird for not only sponsoring this video, but kickstarting my fragrance journey. I have to say they know who they're sending to because another one they sent me was a strawberry shortcake perfume. I am so, this is going to become mine. I'm calling it now. And look at the freaking case. Okay, we have the legend herself on here. They saw I was a nostalgia girly and were like, okay, we have the perfect scent for you. Anyway, I think it's time we finally start thinking about it and get back to the video. The movie begins by introducing us to our main character, 15-year-old Cassie, played by Emily Osmond, and the opening scene features her little brother Max because Cassie is fed up with her little brother going in and out of her room and like not getting in trouble. So to go and get back at him, she sneaks into his closet and scares him with this like rubber monster hand. Obviously because of the commotion in the middle of the night, she does get caught doing this and after she gets caught by her parents for doing so, she kind of storms off annoyed into her room because of the fact that they seem to always take her brother's side and favor him. I mean, I think as the older sibling, she has the right to privacy, she deserves privacy, and it's not that hard to set roles with your children, and then there would be no more of this sort of conflict. Right off the bat, I just feel like this scene really paints a picture of the family dynamics in this household, and the tension is clearly high. I mean, the Keller family is new to town, and Cassie seems to be really upset about it, which is understandable. You know, being new in a town in the middle of the school year is hard on any kid I can imagine. However, what makes Cassie stand out is she is also goth, so let's just say she really stands out amongst, you know, other kids at her new high school. Instead of her mom, um, I don't know, maybe respecting her, she doesn't seem to like her style and even bought her a new outfit that she'd absolutely never wear because her mom's, like, interpretation of this situation and her not being able to make friends is she blames the way she dresses for why she hasn't made any friends at her new 
school yet. But how I read this situation is Cassie clearly had friends where she used to live, at her old school. So I just don't think that's like helping anything by implying or even saying that and buying her clothes she'd never wear trying to fix this problem. She's clearly having a hard enough time already. She doesn't need that from you as a parent. <laughs> Anyway, within the first 15 minutes of this movie, we not only get a feel for family dynamics, but specifically Cassie's reality when it comes to both being new in town and at a new school. When we cut to her at school walking in the hallway, Cassie basically overhears this boy named Sean who, our first impression is that she kind of likes him, but more importantly, his friend plays a prank on him by the lockers and it's clear to her that they have a similar sense of humor by his reaction. So at lunch, when she's sitting alone and overhears Sean talking talking about how he's really stressed about failing his English essay due to the size of the book he picked and also he knows his dad is going to be very, very upset. Cassie realizes she puts two and two together that, hey, this is my opportunity to finally introduce myself because the book that he picks is Edgar Allan Poe, so of course she's read it. Look at this thing. That would be like 10 books for me. I read that book. And she even further mentions when she's actually having a conversation with him that she has an extensive knowledge of all his works in general. Unfortunately, it's here we also meet our popular mean girl character, aka Priscilla, in this scene who she decides to like interrupt their conversation by offering to tutor him and also asking him to the Halloween dance coming up. It's fairly obvious that this interaction came from a place of jealousy, not so of like Cassie herself, maybe so, we don't know this girl's home life, but over the fact that she was like talking to this guy in general. But what I want to note more importantly is like there's no way in hell this girl knows anything about Edgar Allan Poe. She just thought weird girl talking to cute boy no, 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 no. And I'm not saying that to be like gatekeepy because I don't know a lot about Edgar Allan Poe either, but it's just obvious that she's saying this just to kind of say it. And of course while she's there she has to insult Cassie afterwards. Yeah, so original. We haven't heard that one before. And then when Cassie gets up to leave after this, you know, kind of being ticked off, unfortunately, she bumps right into someone getting food all over her clothes. And you know what Sean does during all of this as it's going down? Nothing. He just makes this face. <laughs> Loser. After this, we flash forward to after school when Cassie's at home in her room listening to music on her MP3 player. This has to be the most like 2000s emo and or goth like movie scene I've seen. I mentioned emo because that's what the music in this scene was more so reminding me of than gothic music. Please don't yell at me. I'm just trying to be correct. But compared to like the interaction we saw at the beginning of the movie, it's clear when, you know, Cassie's little brother barges in her room this time how like not respected or like not seen she is by her parents because she gets rudely interrupted by her brother barging into her room and her mom is literally right beside him. So obviously once her brother like runs off, she brings this up to her mom again, you know, being like, hey, like, I don't want him barging into my room, please. A very valid thing to point out in my opinion. But all her mom really says is she just makes this excuse that like her brother was excited to show Cassie his costume. Would you tell him to stay out of my room? He's excited. Before then like segueing their conversation into bringing up her school's Halloween dance because she thinks Cassie should go, even if she's upset a boy didn't ask her. We have no idea if she shared any of like what happened at school that day with her mom, but considering like her lack of respect for Cassie, I would assume not. I would highly doubt it. So I think this is just like an assumption her mom is making about Cassie. My point is only really further confirmed when moments after this scene, Cassie decides she's gonna go to the library. And after she informs her parents, her mom decides to inform her that Monday night, aka Halloween, her parents are going to like a work Halloween party, I believe for her dad's, her dad's boss. So that means Cassie basically is stuck taking care of her brother and like taking him trick-or-treating. Understandably so, she is pissed. She's upset because Halloween is her favorite night of the whole year. You move away from your previous town in the middle of a school year. Your daughter is clearly upset, miserable. She doesn't have her friends anymore. She has been struggling to make new friends, but you can't even let her enjoy the one thing that will be guaranteed to be fun and bring some joy into her life. It's my favorite night of the 
Oh, here. Aren't you getting a little old for trick-or-treating? Also, I don't know if this is a hot take, but I absolutely hate how some parents make their kids, like, parent their siblings. Obviously, I think babysitting once in a while uh, can be helpful. Plus, like, sometimes the parents will, like, pay the kid, and then it's like they're getting something out of it. Not that bad. But where I think this is really unfair is, like, where it becomes a constant thing of, like, them having to parent their siblings, having to watch after them, keep track of them. Because just because they're older doesn't mean they're not a child, too. Thankfully, I am a only child, so I don't have any experience dealing with a situation like this, but I just know that it can weigh on older siblings from, you know, discussions I've seen online. I think if they truly cared about their daughter's interests and or passions, they would have thought about that before committing to go to that party or at least thought about bringing it up to her before doing so. And after she's clearly, clearly upset, her dad has the audacity to ask her to get him a latte while she's out. Thanks a lot. Hey, I'm coming to think of it, I go for a nice latte. I'm not going that way. Because this conversation had started with Cassie informing them she was going to the library, but also saying if anyone needed or wanted anything while she was out, she would be happy to get it. Clearly not anymore. Clearly. Like, you just royally pissed her off. Why would she still do that now? Honestly, fuck these parents. Like, at this point, we're only 17 minutes into this movie, recap-wise, and they have been pissing me off the whole time. But anyway, while in town on her way to the library, Cassie ends up finding this Halloween store, which is, of course, right up her alley. The Halloween store is actually in an alley, but while, like, kind of browsing and looking around, she gets spooked by the apparent, like, store owner or employee whose energy is just, like, really odd. May I help you? So she goes to leave, like she's immediately like, okay, this is weird. But on her way out, he somehow like appears out of nowhere again, telling Cassie to feel free to browse. And that's when she realizes she's right by the book section anyway, which is what he was like trying to want to show her, but then she was like freaked out. So she's like, I'm good. Because Cassie was like carrying a stack of books and he noticed, you know, hey, you're into reading, aren't you? However, the book section isn't much of a section. It's singular. I guess living up to the name of book section, just one? Well, technically, the sign in the movie actually says books, and Cassie points this out, and when she does, the store person just says he'll have the S removed, but soon there wouldn't be any books, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, the only book in this section on the shelf was called The Evil Thing, a scary name in her opinion, but when she goes to kind of look at it, she realizes the book is locked. So the only way to really look at this book is to buy it, because she'll be able to get the key then, and there's no, like, back description for this book. So she does. She buys the book for just five dollars. And the red flags should have been blaring at this point because the price, there was no price set. He just asked how much she would pay and she was just like, five dollars? Sold! <laughs> Which is so sketchy, especially when she immediately goes to open the lock and he goes, not in here, and like rushes Cassie outside of the store and even closes the store automatically. <laughs> All I have to say is bad, bad, bad vibes. Or should I say evil vibes? When she does unlock the book outside, there's immediately like a gust of wind and leaves, but we also notice the first page says, do not read aloud. The next day at school, we find out who won the pumpkin queen, since it's also like the day of the Halloween dance. Obviously, since she's new, Cassie wonders like what that even entails. And she happens to be still like getting her lunch on her tray when she says this. So the lunch lady basically tells us it's a school tradition that has to do with like a pinata and poetry. It's a beautiful tradition. The poetry, the music, the pinata, pinata, yes, the pumpkin pinata, but it's so sexy. Only the queen is allowed to hit it over. And I explain it like so vague because she doesn't go into any more detail than that, especially about the poetry aspect. Of course, the winner is Priscilla because she is, you know, the popular girl of the school, but this still intrigued Cassie. So last minute, she decided to attend the dance. After school, we see her get a order like delivered to the house, but we don't know what it was until she is actually at the dance. Basically, wearing a scary mask, Cassie decides to lie to these kids on pinata duty that some teacher like needed their help with something else that was like helping run the dance. Confused, they, you know, were like, oh, that's weird. I thought we were just on pinata duty and they went on their way because not knowing who she was, you know, because she was wearing the mask, they just took her word. And this gave Cassie the perfect opportunity to dump something in the pinata. So when Priscilla eventually takes the stage and hits this pinata along with a bunch of candy that was inside it, roaches fall all over her, causing her to not only freak out, but then fall off over the stage onto this like Halloween cake they have on a table nearby. This 
this of course completely tarnishes her reputation with people making jokes about her left and right. Everyone at the dance was concerned at first but then bursted out laughing at her, including Cassie. She found the whole thing very comical because her plan had clearly, you know, been a success. Unluckily for Cassie, Priscilla does confront her that day, knowing in her gut, like not having any proof that it's Cassie, but knowing that she did it. But Cassie is not scared in the slightest. She really could not care less. I know it was you. Proven. You are so dead. <gasps> So during English class that day, since Sean sits behind her, Priscilla passes him notes saying if he gets Cassie's diary out of her bag, then she'll write his term paper. But again, she was already gonna do that. You don't know shit about Edgar Allan Poe. And despite the conversation they had where Cassie was really nothing but nice to him, he does take it only for Priscilla to open it and realize that wasn't really her diary. It was the evil thing. Only she doesn't know the context of that, obviously, but she does notice like the wind going out of control outside suddenly as soon as she opens this book. Before class ends and shortly after that, she gives the book back to Sean who puts it back in Cassie's bag. So Cassie still has the evil thing in her possession on Halloween night when she's watching her brother. Before her parents go to the party, she takes Max trick-or-treating and there ends up being this like big house that apparently, according to some other kids like who were out trick-or-treating, has wax lips. Hey guys, look, they give away wax with the friends. Wax lips? I love wax lips. But he won't go inside and he won't have Cassie go inside because he's too scared. Like he kind of freezes up because the house is basically one of those big houses where they go all out and essentially make like a mini haunted house attraction. By far the coolest houses to come across while trick-or-treating if you ask me. Like I guarantee houses like that have the best candy, the best Max would get all night since those wax lips are his favorite. But again, even after Cassie was actually being encouraging and like nice to her brother, he would not do it. So she just got really fed up and started to walk off and eventually he followed her, not wanting to be left alone. She really only did this so that he would follow her because clearly he wasn't making a decision, clearly he wasn't gonna go in the house. It's not like she'd actually leave him alone, but when they get home, he immediately bursts out. Hey, hey. Cassie left me alone! Like the tattletale he is. And of course the parents take his side, like always with the dad going back out to that house with him to get him some wax lips. And the mom immediately getting on Cassie's case about, you know, getting along with her brother. Now, when it comes to the party, her mom informs Cassie they'll be home late, but she wants Max in bed no later than 9 p.m. And just simply asks Cassie to try to get along with him. After this, we see the parents pull out of the driveway, confirming that they are no longer there. As Max is standing on the porch, waving with his wax lips, attempting to say the words goodbye. But more importantly, in front of their house behind some garbage bags, we see Priscilla and Sean hiding. How the hell did they even get her address is my question. Cause yeah, like she was gonna offer to help Sean with his essay, but they never even got that far before she was interrupted. Anyway, remember how I mentioned the prank in the beginning of the movie that Sean liked? Well, the prank was this like shock pen thing to be specific and Sean actually brought it with him and was like laying with it. It. Now, I can smell what the comments are going to say when I mention this. It was normalized, but it was the 2000s. Me personally, I don't care. But basically, Priscilla sees this like shock pen and calls it the Arsler. Because this is like an R.L. Stein movie, this is the last thing I expected. Me personally, every time I hear that word in like older media, it will never not shock me. It always catches me so, so off guard. But as I'm about to like give praises for this movie, I just wanted to like mention this moment because it's truly my only critique. I mean, I have a problem with the parents too, but without that dynamic, we wouldn't have got the story and the movie we got. But without, you know, her saying the R slur, nothing about this movie or its plot would change. Okay, sorry, I got a little sidetracked, but after this moment, Sean expresses his like disinterest for being a part of whatever they're about to do. But of course, he's like every other man and Priscilla gives him a reason to stick around and help her out with this. Why don't we just forget this? Well, why don't we forget me writing your term paper? All well, meanwhile, Cassie is in her room working on a paper for school when her little brother, who's supposed to be asleep, barges in her room once again and like tries to immediately grab her stuff, which in this case was the book, The Evil Thing, which he then demands her to read to him, but she insists that it's too scary. 
Now, because of the way their parents really like coddle Max, I assume that like because he doesn't get his way here, he then decides to take it out on his sister, purposely turning off her like extension cable, which turns off her computer, and he immediately claims it wasn't on purpose, but I don't really believe that for a second, just knowing the dynamics we have at play here in this household. But Cassie is understandably furious because due to her brother, she just lost hours worth of writing that she had been working on for school for this supposed essay. Initially, while she did say she wouldn't read the book because it was too scary, because her brother just like really got her angry and irritated, she now doesn't mind reading him the scary story. And when he asks her, what are you gonna do? She grabs the evil thing. They then go to her brother's room and despite the very clear warning stating do not read aloud, she does just that, reading the book aloud to her brother. And that's where the second part of the movie's name comes in. Through reading the story, we find out the evil thing isn't real unless you think about it but the evil thing is also described in detail like in this section of the movie to kind of give us a better idea of what we should be scared of. Due to the numerous times this video has been copyrighted, enjoy my rendition of The Evil Thing. The Evil Thing is a gruesome beast. On living flesh, it loves to feast. It's a two-headed thing, which you don't wish to greet. One head sucks your blood, one head chews your meat. It carries its babies and slimy eggs on its back. The babies are hungry when they hatch for a snack, so the evil thing traps some poor victim alive for the babies to eat when their birthdays arrive. But don't worry, don't cry, please don't have a fit. The evil thing is not real unless you think about it. Thank you. Imagine me taking a bow. Of course, her brother immediately thinks about it, and when Cassie further feels his fear of the evil thing, he ends up, like, literally being moved to tears, absolutely sobbing because he's so scared. So she clarifies, of course, that it's not real and that she just wanted to scare him so he'll calm down. But what she doesn't realize is that isn't a true statement. The real reason the book said not to read it aloud was because when done, a monster aka the evil thing, would be released. So Cassie, reading this book, awakened this monster. A little while after her brother finally goes to sleep, the power goes out in the house, meaning she lost her writing for a second time now. So she goes outside her house to take a look and see what's wrong, but her brother follows her, hollering about how it's the evil thing and that they have to go back inside, as if being so loud wouldn't just like attract the evil thing to them. And Cassie actually starts to really get scared, looking around with her flashlight to see like like, what's out there? Because as they're outside standing in front of this like a uh, power strip, I don't know what to call it, they hear this like these growling noises, growling type sound. However, it turns out she was just being pranked by Priscilla and Sean with some Halloween decoration they put like above her and Priscilla basically filmed her freaking out on camera as some kind of like gotcha payback moment for what happened at the Halloween dance. Everyone at school is gonna wanna see this video. And as for the growls, it was just Sean with a noise machine, which Max thinks is really cool. As Priscilla is like mocking her about that moment being videoed, her brother Max even chimes in with, oh, you are so scared. As if his sister isn't being bullied right in front of him. <sighs> I know he's just a kid. I know he's just a kid. The two of them soon leave with Sean giving this like pathetic stare at her before saying, I would have been scared too. Like he didn't just help Priscilla do this to humiliate her. It's not all men, but it's always a man. Don't pretend like you care about her because you clearly do not. Cassie and her brother, of course, bicker some more about who was more scared, but it's way past Max's bedtime. So she yells at him to go to bed, but to make sure to brush his teeth because he was like eating a cookie for some reason. Now it's here where we have a little bit of a full circle moment. After he brushed his teeth, Max is now sitting in bed trying to fall asleep when his closet door is like creaking open, but only this time he assumes it's Cassie because she had tried to scare him a few nights before. But when he starts yelling like, Cassie, I know it's you, things on the lines of that, Cassie opens his like bedroom door confused and just tells him to go to bed. After she leaves, we see this like tentacle looking thing stick out from the darkness within his closet. And Max at this point is just beyond terrified. After Max calls for her again and she yells back from the other room to just go to bed, the tentacle goes back into the darkness and Max makes a run for it hiding under his bed. Then we see this like 
absolutely terrifying shot of Max under the bed as he sees these like talon claw things walking around the floor and hearing these faint growling noises. The evil thing is knocking over toys and other things just trying to find Max before getting on top of his bed, which it's obviously way too big for. And so Max from below the bed just sees this huge lump suddenly like crushing him and he has to kind of like stay as low as he can in an effort to stay hidden, of course. The evil thing continues to knock things over, even decapitating his poor stuffed chimpanzee, which at the end, like, Cassie ends up, like, duct taping back together, and I thought that was so funny. But Cassie's reaction to all of this ruckus as this is happening is just putting on her earbuds to listen to music so she can block out the noise, assuming it's Max doing this on purpose. Unfortunately for Max, due to shifting his position a lot, his feet end up, like, sticking out from underneath the bed. So the evil thing takes this opportunity to, like, grab him by his feet with its tentacles. It's horrifying. It's at this point we cut to Sean and Priscilla at the park where she's enjoying the misery she knows Cassie will experience once this video gets out. However, Sean has other plans taking, like, I believe it's the SD card out and, like, walking off because he knows deep down that this isn't right, that it's too mean, and he doesn't care about his stupid paper anymore. This leaves Priscilla alone in the park to carry all this stuff that went into this prank home by herself, but her little temper tantrum she's having over this ends up attracting the evil thing. Now, Sean is still, like, he's distant, but, like, he's still in the proximity that he can hear this happening, but because of the sound machine, he assumes that this is simply, like, a trick, that she wants to, like, trick him to go back so she can, like, convince him to change his mind and, like, help her or whatever. <laughs> such a bad actress. Which I can't lie, I did laugh. Um, I let out a little giggle, maybe even a little chuckle, but Priscilla definitely was not laughing. As she hides behind this Canary Park sign, there's a small hole in the sign, and she decides to look through it, but anyone who's ever seen a scary movie would know turning your back is definitely, like, a bad move. So it's unsurprising to me when the evil thing is directly behind her when she, like, turns back around from looking inside that hole. Obviously, this causes her to, again, freak out, and her scream Screams this time sound a lot more convincing, so Sean reluctantly decides to turn back and see what's going on. By the time he gets there, we see two people covered in, like, a cocoon. They're, like, cocooned in some type of goo? One of them is obviously Priscilla, and the other is Cassie's brother, Max. So quickly, Sean runs off undetected, thankfully back to Cassie's house. By this point, she is watching a movie in the kitchen, no longer blasting music, so she hears when Sean is frantically knocking on the door. After she answers, Sean informs her that the evil thing is very much real and it's got her brother. Her only reply was jokingly saying, it can't be, I got my brother right here, as she's like holding this like meat that is being thawed out for tomorrow's dinner. <laughs> I think in an effort to, like, freak Sean out, but, you know, he knows what he saw. She's not convinced, though, and she insists that he's just sleeping in the other room. So Sean runs upstairs into Max's room to check on him, and the reality of the situation finally dawns on Cassie, seeing the absolute mess. Plus, the goo remnants left behind on the windowsill, which the window was, like, wide open, so that's clearly where the evil thing went. It begins to really hit Cassie that he's telling the truth and she ignored the rules by reading the book to Max. Sean says they should just call the cops, but knowing the gravity of the situation, she says they have to kill the evil thing. I mean, Sean just knows her brother was scared of something called the evil thing when they scared Cassie. He doesn't really know the context of this book unless Priscilla told him what she saw in that book when she assumed it was her diary, but like, we don't know. That did not happen on screen. It's also Halloween, so Cassie just knows like they're not gonna, the police is not gonna believe them and by the time they come, it might even be too late. So quickly, they head to the park where the evil thing is no longer there. And before this scene, we get a glimpse of what's actually going on with all the victims of the evil thing they're in this like big spider web and not only is the evil thing like the Alaskan bullworm on drugs <laughs> but being in a cocoon like that may just be like new fear unlocked hello I'm not one to be like super claustrophobic but my god that would be like I think I would lose my mind that would be so claustrophobic anyway back at the park Cassie and Sean are inspecting what's left and end up following this trail of goo um on the hunt for this creature the only thing they have besides flashlights by the way is a walking stick to kill this thing I hate to say it but Sean's right a walking stick. I 
Are you sure the guy doesn't have a shotgun or something? He's really starting to redeem himself, unfortunately, is what I thought before the conversation that happens two seconds later. First of all, what are you so ticked off about anyway? And your brother, I mean, what do you mean? He annoys me. Her annoyance of her brother is a simple sibling rivalry, but also he doesn't know the dynamics in their household and how Cassie's parents clearly play favorites, at least in my opinion, but don't really listen to her or hear her out in general. But he also points out like what she did to Priscilla. That cockroach feeling, I mean, that was kind of over the top. She didn't say that. I don't know. I mean, ugh. So she dissed you. Be cool. Whatever. When it's so much more than that, it's being unnecessarily snobby and rude to someone who's done nothing to you personally simply because they are different and new to school in the middle of the school year. I mean, we saw her, like, being nothing but nice to Sean and his friend. What warranted her to say any of that to Cassie, besides jealousy? But that's besides the point. They find this sewage tunnel-looking thing, I think, which has more goo, remnants all over it, and Cassie says Sean doesn't need to go with her because ultimately this is her fault, but he tags along anyway. It's here they find this like spider web secret layer with the cocoons. They call out to Max and he responds and so begins the task of actually trying to get anyone out of these cocoons. But as they are doing so, they start to notice a foul smell which causes Cassie to ask Sean, But the smell is actually coming from the one and only evil thing who's just entered the cave, like, area. Really, I don't know what to call this place. This week, a hot new bombshell enters the villa. Don't call me up. Cassie's reaction, besides being, I don't know, absolutely terrified, is to hit the evil thing with the walking stick, but the only thing that happens is its head, like, splits in two. Uh-uh. No. This catches her off guard, so she immediately drops the walking stick, and afterward, Sean's stick breaks, and they panic, and they run off, not knowing what to do next. The whole time this is happening, I really thought to myself, like, is she gonna fill Sean in on the context of this book? Is she gonna go back and get help from the creepy, like, shop owner? But Sean only starts, like, asking questions when they escape the evil thing, and then they're in the woods again. This is when Cassie mentions the Halloween store, and they decide to go back and find the shop owner. After knocking, nobody answers, but they catch him as he seems to be, like, packing up his car outside, so she walks up to him and brings up that clearly he knew this book was magic. But his only reply is, there's a warning on the first page. I mean, he, he is right. But then Cassie mentions how the evil thing is alive, and he gets super creepy again, bringing up how Cassie must be so excited to see the fear on her brother's face, because aren't you the girl that likes to scare people? Aren't you the girl who likes to scare people? It's a powerful feeling to watch others cringe in fear. I bet you can't wait to see the frightened expression on your brother's face when he uh, sees those babies at you. Then he brings up buyer's remorse as if she was even asking for a refund. No, she just wants this thing to stop and to free her brother. She never even brought up money or getting her money back. But the only answer he gives is that it's Cassie herself who should do something and she's the one who freed the evil thing from the book, so she's the one who must figure out how to return it there. Cassie brings up how none of this would have happened happened if he hadn't sold her the book, but you know what he says? It's her who brought him to this town. This is where we find out a whole new layer to this lore, okay? It goes deep. It truly was Cassie who brought him to this town because of her wish to scare people. Every year, he basically picks a person who wants to scare people the most, and this year it was between Cassie and a nine-year-old from Detroit, but obviously she won. After this interaction, they look back at the alley where the store once was, and it is completely empty now, as if there was never even a store there. Before driving off, they simply are left with the words, Two heads are better than one. That's the way to get the bloody job done. And Cassie immediately knows this is a riddle, but can't seem to, like, figure it out, while Sean just states the obvious, pointing out the expression, two heads are better than one. But obviously Cassie knows, like, it cannot be that, because it's too obvious. And them having two heads doesn't help their case at all. And he replies, unless they fought each other, which sparks an idea within Cassie, that the only way they can defeat the evil thing is to make it fight and destroy itself. So her and Sean take the bloody job part literally, going back to Cassie's house and using what was supposed to to be tomorrow's dinner as like they use the blood they funnel the blood into a container and they bring it with them by doing this they're basically able to get the creature to devour itself destroying the evil thing as they happen to be doing this the babies have just hatched and are heading straight towards max priscilla and i can only assume the pizza guy from the beginning i forgot to mention him but he's there and it kind of makes sense that i don't mention him because they don't actually know he's there these babies though uh immediately reminded me of 
was like season two of Stranger Things. There was like these slug-like creatures. I know Dustin, I think, keeps one as a pet, but they slither over to the spiderweb cocoons and just like the evil thing, they have this huge set of teeth that again, reminds me of the Alaskan bullworm. It's horrifying. Luckily, Cassie and Max get there just in the nick of time. These babies had just started gnawing their way through the spider web, but hadn't made it to like Max himself or anyone else themselves underneath it all. To lure the evil thing, their plan is they brought the radio, you know, the noise machine with those growling noise to hopefully have the effect of a mating call on the evil thing, luring it right into their trap and then they can pour the blood on it. Unfortunately, it ends up nudging the radio with its head, which hits the button and changes it to what is actual music playing instead of like the growling, so that ruins the trap. And after this, they really could have still poured the blood and everything would have been fine, but they managed to like fumble pouring it and they drop the pitcher because they were fighting over who would pour it. Luckily for Max and honestly everyone else there, uh, the one of the babies like gets to him beneath the spider web and Max actually defends himself and is able to break free. So ultimately he's able to get the pitcher, although once he realizes, hey, this is blood, he drops it out of fear. Then we kind of circle back to the beginning, you know, when he was scared of the big like haunted house that had the wax teeth. No matter how bad he wanted those wax teeth, he couldn't get himself to go up to the house out of fear. He was like frozen, but Cassie and him have this moment where from above, she tells him she loves him and that she believes in him. So Max successfully saves the day by throwing the blood at the evil thing, causing it to attack itself. Despite what I've said about Max in this video, they absolutely did him dirty here with all these shots of the evil thing attacking itself because while Cassie and Sean are like excited and amazed, their plan worked and they're gonna be able to save everyone. Max is scared shitless watching this all go down. This poor boy, oh my god, he's gonna have nightmares for the rest of his life. Anyway, this like yellow light starts shining out of the evil thing and it explodes and this like gross yellow goo stuff goes everywhere. <laughs> At least it's gone for good. Afterwards, they break free Priscilla, and even though she technically, like Cassie, technically saved her life, she goes off on Cassie almost immediately, calling her a witch, not even giving her or Sean a thank you for saving her. And actually, she tries to get Sean to come with her as, you know, she goes to leave. But for once, he chooses Cassie. I think I want Cassie home. You will! Character development, yay! Then they realized, you know, the pizza guy's there, which they had no idea about, and they he basically immediately offers them free pizza, which I thought was pretty funny. Here we go. I got a couple of large pizza with two toppings. Your choice coming at you. And as he drives away in his somehow like working but very much broken car, he even offers like Priscilla, who's walking alone, a ride, but she replies, "In your dreams." Girl, he doesn't want you. He was just being nice. I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't know that this guy was also in the cave with them just now. Then we cut back to Cassie's house. Everyone's able to get a change of clothes. Max and Sean are enjoying some of the free pizza from the pizza guy. And Cassie gave uh, Sean some of her dad's clothes to wear and washed his clothes since, again, they got monster goo all over them from the aftermath of the explosion. After she gives him his clothes back, the three of them gather around the fireplace and they burn the book, The Evil Thing. So nobody will ever have to deal with the evils of this thing ever again. Then the movie ends with Cassie offering to tutor Sean because he still has this essay to write and she's clearly knowledgeable about the subject. Plus, they really got along. So he accepts this offer and before leaving, tells her to stay weird. Afterwards, Cassie reads her brother, the Berenstein Bears go to camp, and they fall asleep in Cassie's room, which her parents are delighted to see when they finally come home. Though this experience was definitely probably one with a lasting impact, it really did seem to bring the two of them closer together as siblings, despite the, you know, apparent favoritism in the household. But you know who I'm still left hating? These shithead parents. Tell me why. The dad ends up, like, finding the book in the fireplace. He takes it out. He jokingly reads the warning after showing it to the mom and she says read it listen to this do not read aloud <laughs> read it and he does while they laugh are you kidding you oh my god okay you really should see my face <laughs> words don't describe my anger i still stand by what i said fuck these parents and the cutoff for this movie is really funny because like after that happens and you're like oh my god no what's going on not this we cut right to emily osmont singing a pop song called don't think about it in a studio booth like the movie didn't just 
end on the worst note possible. Although I have to appreciate the ending because there are quite a few kids movies where they don't have a bad ending. And I know as a kid that used to really piss me off because I remember right after I saw, I think it was Toy Story 3, it's the one where they're like in the trash compactor thing and they almost die. When I was walking out of the theater with my dad, although I enjoyed the movie, I asked him like, why is it always a good ending? Like I'm tired of it being a good ending. So I can't appreciate this despite the fact that the parents Oh, they make me so mad. I, I don't even need to say it anymore, you guys know. As for the song, I do like it, but I almost wish the instrumental had a little bit more of a goth or like generally Halloween vibe to it. Like I feel like it's too poppy, if that makes sense. Did someone say poppy? It's such a jarring shift after the ending, but ultimately I was, after a minute of like, I did start, you know, busting a move. And yeah, that is the Haunting Hour Don't Think About It by R.L. Stein. I hope you guys enjoyed and let me know in the comments if you had heard of this movie before, if you, you know, liked it as a kid, um, any other thoughts you have. This was so fun to cover and so fun to watch. This is definitely going to become like an annual Halloween watch for me. I really thoroughly loved this movie, especially I love the main character. She's so cool and badass. I want to give a huge thank you to my Patreon as always. Thank you guys so much for your your support and carrying on R.L. Stein month on my channel. The next video I'm gonna do is going to be reading a Goosebumps book, which you guys, it's a mystery, you'll see, but I'm so, so excited for that because I have not read one of those in years. I've been really getting back into reading on this channel and I'm not mad about it because I'm definitely a victim of doom scrolling sometimes, so it's very helpful. I need to actually pick up a book. Yes, I do. Thank you again to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. Again, the link will be in the description and my code is Lula Loopsy for 55% off your first month. You can also scan the QR code that is on screen. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you guys in my next video.